Rochester was known as the capital of fine tailoring in the country. We may not have had the same production levels that were coming out of New York or Chicago, but it was really known for the best quality, and we're very proud to have maintained that tradition and that heritage. It really is an honor and a privilege to be working with Ralph Lauren to dress America's athletes for probably the most prestigious sporting event in the world. That was a snippet of a commercial that was run in 2016 promoting the opening ceremony uniforms of the United States Olympics team when they went to the Rio Olympics. And obviously I worked on that project. Uh, we were manufacturing it. Those are my hands sewing those brass buttons and, and sketching and cutting. And um, we're going to look at how we can recreate that button that was used in that um, opening ceremony uniform. I just thought since... We are currently hopefully nearing the end of the pandemic and hoping that the Olympic Games that were supposed to happen in 2020 may happen this summer in 2021. We're still not sure. And, and so in that spirit, I thought, let's do something Olympic themed. So in Blender, I'm going to assume you have a basic understanding of Blender. Um, this is not a, a how to use Blender um, video. If, if you're new to Blender, I highly suggest you go over to CG Cookie. They've got some great introductory stuff. That said, I will try to walk you through all the steps of this and not skip over things assuming you know everything in case there's steps that you don't know. So the first thing I'm going to do when doing this button is I'm going to start with a new mesh. So by hitting Shift A, I'm going to click on Mesh and select a cylinder. And obviously that's not the shape of this, the, the button that I want. So I'm going to hit S, which is going to scale, and then Z, because I want to scale just in the Z axis. And when that blue line pops up, that tells you that we're just scaling in the Z. So I'm going to bring the button down and make it hmm, something like, like this. Because as I look at the edge, there's, there's sort of a rim that looks roughly that thickness. We're in object mode, so I'm going to hit tab to go into edit mode, and then hit two to go into edge select mode and holding the alt key I will select this edge and so it puts a nice loop around for me and I'm going to hit I to inset and I'm going to inset this a couple times so I'm just making a nice shape which we're going to make our dome now if I were to use the grab key G and just pull this up it's just pulling the inside so what I want to do is I want to go up here and turn on proportional editing. So we have the choice of what kind of shape we want in proportional editing. And sometimes you just have to sort of fiddle around to find what you want. Um, in this case, since we're going for, it's not quite a sphere. It's kind of between a sphere and a root. We could go either way. But let's start with a sphere. So we select the sphere and then click on this button to turn it on. And so this time, if I were to grab that face and pull it up, see it's moving everything. And maybe we don't want the whole thing to move, but actually it kind of looks, yeah, it looks not bad. It looks like our button, so I'm going to leave that. If I go into object mode and right click and shade smooth, it's going to show us how Blender is interpreting the edges. And I st still think it's a little too chunky. So to get a little bit smoother, I'm going to apply a subsurface modifier. And what that's going to do is instead of actually creating additional vertices uh, and edges, it's going to simulate them. So I go over to here, this wrench, which is where all the modifiers live, they're cool tools, go add modifier, subdivision surface. So you can see how it's changed the shape of my button. But in our case, we want to maintain some of these edges. It smoothed off some of it a little bit too much. So the way that we're going to correct for that is we're going to bevel some edges. So 
again with two selected and the alt key held down I will click on this edge it selects the edge loop and I'm going to hit control B and pull out a little bevel and it's not doing exactly what I wanted and it's probably because when I scaled I didn't apply the scale so let's go back and hit control A and apply the scale go back into edit mode hit 2 again Alt, grab the ring, Control B, and then pull with the mouse out. And it's only giving me one edge, and I'd rather something a little bit rounder. And so I roll my mouse wheel up a few times, and that's giving me a few more of these subdivisions so I can control how I bevel my edge. And you see how that the form underneath is starting to change. It'll be more dramatic when we do the one underneath. So again, two, hold the Alt key, grab that loop. Let's bevel that. So control B to bevel. Oh, my mouse is being silly today. And that looks, let's go into object mode. That looks a lot better. That's more like the shape that I want. So the next thing we need is we need a shank. And the shape of this shank is, is kind of rectangular. And if I was going for total realness, I would spend a lot more time on it. But because I want to focus more on the Substance Painter function, we're going to cheat. We're going to make a shank that doesn't look exactly like this one in real life because you're not even going to see it in my rendering. It's hidden under the button. So the easiest way to make a shank would be to in, oh, let's go back to object mode, hit Shift A, add a mesh, and I'm going to create a torus, which is basically a donut, but it's too big. So I'm going to rotate it by hitting R, and then I want to rotate it in the X axis, so I'll hit X and then 90 on the number pad, and it rotates at 90 degrees in the X axis. R, X, 90, and enter there. And then we're going to scale it down. So bring it down to something like that. That looks about right. And I'm not going to move it into place just yet. Let's look at it shaded smooth. That looks OK. And again, we're not going to see it anyways. So the reason I'm not moving it up is because we need to unwrap the UVs. And um, it's usually best to do it where your seam's not going to be obvious. I talked about UV mapping in another post. So if it's completely new to you, uh, I'll try to link to that in the text of, of this um, video. So in order to get into the UV editing mode, we go up to this corner and pull a screen aside. So we're going to be able to see the mesh, and then we're also going to see, be able to see the UV map. So up here in this corner where it looks like a railroad track, and it's the edit editor type, and right now we're in the 3D viewport, I'm going to change this to UV editor. And I have nothing selected, so there's nothing showing up. If I were to select, if I were to select this, go into edit mode and hit A to select all. It's done an okay job of unwrapping it, but it's not exactly what I want. So I'm going to define how we're going to unwrap it. I want this map to come and wrap around this edge. I don't want any visible seam here because that can be ugly in the texturing. I'm going to put the seam underneath. And so again, with that two selected, holding alt, click, that grabs that loop, and then I right click and say mark seam. I'm going to do the same thing on the shank, and the reason I'm, I have it pulled down here is because I want to put this seam where we're not going to see it. So back into object mode, select the loop, tab back into edit. See how it's unwrapped and it's kind of bizarre. So with the two again, I'm going to select and I'm going to try to, oh, I did it. Sometimes it, it grabs an, a different loop than the one you wanted. And so I'm going to right click and mark seam. And then we're going to go underneath and click there. That's what I wanted and mark seam. And now let's look at it from this side. G to grab 
Z to constrain to the Z axis and move it up into my button so it looks like there's part. So now we go back into object mode. These are two things, so cylinder torus. I should have renamed them to button and shank, but we're going to grab these two and hit control J to join. And now it's one mesh object and I'm going to change the name to button underscore USOT for US Olympic team. And now I'm going to wrap again. So tab back into edit mode, hit A, and see it, now it's totally goofy because we've got UV chunks sitting on top of each other. So now I will hit U and select unwrap, and there's my button, the top of the button, the bottom of the button, and the shank. So we have our UV map, and it's usually, I like to save the UV layout because you can use that in uh, Photoshop. So we're gonna put this custom button, USOT, and you're getting a sneak peek of the next step. So USOT underscore UV, because we can use that for texturing in Photoshop, which we're not going to do in this case, but just in case I wanted to, I like to have it available. And then the last thing I need to do is export this OBJ. So we're going to export away from OBJ, put it back in, where is it? Custom button, USOT, and call it US. OT underscore button. So this is a, a, a fun, cool little function to create the raised edges, the raised effect of the button. Um, I could have modeled it in Blender, but that would have taken a lot of work um, to model actual mesh details. So instead, we're going to use height information on the height channel to create a stamp that's going to make it look like the logo is raised up like it is in this button. So I'm going to go to File, New, and select my button, OBJ. Change the document resolution to 2K, and hit OK. And there's our button with that UV tile layout. Next thing we need to do is to bake some maps. and. I will get into all that nonsense in another post, uh, but the way to do it, we go up to this little icon, the texture set settings, and we're going to scroll down and we're going to find this button that says make bake mesh maps. I'm going to change this to a 2K resolution. And so in, in 3D modeling, especially animation, it's typical that let's say you're going to make a character that you want to animate and that character has a lot of detail so that mesh is very very detailed high poly and very very heavy like it could be 500 megs um, of information and that's very difficult for animating and stuff and so what's typical is you'll have a, a very high detailed poly mesh uh, for all your detail information and then you make a lower poly mesh version of it for animating and in Substance Painter, you can bring in the low poly mesh and texture it, but then bake the the normal maps and the details using the high poly mesh as sort of the skin. So it's a, a much lower density file. It's easier to use and work with. Um, and so that's why we have this button here to you either apply bring in a different mesh if this if this. this hmm. If this is my low poly mesh and I want I have another one that has a lot more detail, I would say, okay, bake the normal maps on that other high poly mesh. But in this case, since we don't have another one, we're gonna check use low poly mesh as high poly mesh. And going to leave everything as it is, I will hit bake. I have a zippy graphics card, so this goes pretty quickly, but in some cases it could be slower. And then hit okay, we have our maps. Defaults to having a paint layer open, which we don't need right now, so I'm going to cut this layer. And the first thing we need is a material. So let's go to our shelf and find a material for it. And now for the stamp. So in Photoshop, I had created this map for the stamp, and it was using the same technique as I did for the displacement map. 
And it's the same idea. In, in substance, they call it height, and in Clo it's a displacement map. But the idea is that whatever's black is the lowest, whatever's white is raised up, and any amount of gray, like these stripes and stars, will be, so if it's 50% gray, it'll be 50% of the height from black to white. So these are a little bit lower, but they're not quite as low as the black areas. So I create that in Photoshop, and I save it out, and then in Substance Painter, I've got to import that as an alpha. So I would go to File, Import Resources, Add Resources, and find my file. And I have to define it. So it says undefined. I have to say this is an alpha. And import your resources to, I just want it in the current session, not my general shelf. If I wanted it to use it in many, many projects, I would import it to shelf, so it's always there. But I'm not going to make a zillion Olympic team buttons, so I'm just going to bring it to my current session and hit import. Now we have to create another layer that's going to contain this height information. So I would contain, I would create another fill layer and see, boom, everything's gone. It's because this layer is covering the brass one. So we want to create a mask like we would in Photoshop. So I'm going to add a black mask, gone. And then we need to add some paint. So I'd right click on that and say, add paint. And there's nothing there because we haven't painted anything on it. And that's what we're going to do in a second. So we're going to go back and click on this gray sphere because we want the base layer, this layer selected. We're going to go to this squiggly, which is going to open up our properties for this fill layer. And you see here how we have the option to affect color, height, rough, metal, normal, uh, all these channels. But really, we don't want to change the color. We don't want to change these other things. All we want to do is change the height. So instead of unclicking everything, I can just hold the Alt key and click on height, and it deselects everything else. So down here in the height, we talked about black being lowest. Well, in this case, we can either go, we can either raise it up or go down into it. So black is the middle. Black is flat. And if I went all the way to the left, I'd be lowering it. I'd be punching into the surface. This one we want to raise up, so we're going to crank it all the way to the right. So whatever I paint on here is going to raise up. And this is where it gets fun. So with my paint layer selected, I'm going to grab a brush. And so now that little dot is the preview of my brush. And I need to change some parameters of it. So I'm going to right click. And we'll play around with the size and things in a minute, but first I'm going to come down here to the alpha, because we can use any of these shapes that come in Substance Painter as an alpha, basically a stamp. So I'm just going to type in USOT, it'll run a filter, and there's that alpha that I brought in. Ta-da! But see, it's normally in a brush you would want a, lo a lot of the instances of the brush, and in this case, we don't. So we're going to go change the spacing from 20 to, say, 120. So now, instead of having a whole bunch of them, we just have one. So I can stamp it on. I'm just going to have a look at everything looks cool. The size is not going to be good, though. So see, you can see the image, and it's way smaller than my button. And even if I cranked the size of it up, it's still not big enough. So what I can do to fix that is I can right click in this space again to go back into my brush properties. And if I scroll down to size space, here it's set to object, I'm going to set it to viewport. And that's going to change generally the scaling. So what used to be small is suddenly huge. Now it's too big. So let's turn this down. And that's now too small. So I can hit control and use my middle mouse button, but it's not super precise. You see there's there's a lot of space between the two jumps, so I'm just going to get it to, I know that's going to be too big, so we're now at 49.85. Now I'm just going to turn it down to, let's say 40, let's try 44. Position it on. And if I then, and this is where Substance Painter is a lot of fun too, because I can either paint in the 3D space or in the 2D. But in this case, because it's a, a, a domed surface and it'd be kind of tough to uh, line it up correctly, 
it's easier to do it in the 2D space. And there, it's done. Wasn't that fun? That was so easy. And we can just change the lighting around to see how it's given it that that effect of a raised logo. Let's let's just look at the size a little bit. Yeah, I think that looks about right. I'll take a screenshot so I have a thumbnail when I bring this into Clo. And then the last thing I want to do is export the textures. So I will go to File, Export Textures. And see, I was working in Keyshot earlier, so I have this output template set to Keyshot. But I'm going to change it back to PBR Metallic Roughness. So, and then I'm going to select in the output templates, also select PBR Metallic Roughness. It's going to tell us the list of exports that looks about right. Last thing I want to do is change the output directory and send it to my button file and then export. And that's it. We're done in Substance Painter. And now we're back in Clo. And you can probably hear my puppies panting and snoring in the background. They just got back from a long hot walk. Normally I work in inches and lines with for, for button sizes, but the, currently there's a bug in the new register button interface for those formats. So I've switched over to millimeters for the time being. So to register the button, we go up to materials, button, register button. And this is kind of cool. This is new where you can set up several different sizes of button at the same time. So. I'll name my button, grab a thumbnail, and then I want two, so I hit this little plus button. So there's going to be two sizes of button. So I'm going to say, but I'm going to call them 32 line and 24 line for now. And I know that two, 20, 32 line is 20 millimeters, so we can leave it at that. And then size two is going to be 24 line. And that's going to be about 15 millimeters. Oh, and it's a shank button, so I've got to set the height. The height's going to be 6 millimeters high. These are a little taller than usual. And I want 32 to be my default. I've got to go grab my OBJ. And then for 24 line, I have to go grab my OBJ as well. And we are about good, so I can hit OK and it's registered as a button preset. But we're not quite done. That's just the shape that doesn't have the brass yet, that doesn't have um, the logo on it yet. So we still have some more work to do. So I'm going to go in and let's add a new button. And we'll call this USOT 24 line. So we go over to this drop down for the shape and we're gonna see at the bottom of our list, there's that button we just created but it's not really brass yet and there's a th uh, 24 line so I want to change this to 24 and this is new that's kind of cool and I'm going to change this from fabric mat to metal and then like that other um, tutorial where we looked at texturing in Photoshop we're still going to go grab some textures so the first thing we want is the base color from substance painter and we want the normal map. And we want the displacement map. Well, actually, I'll leave this off for a second because maybe you'll see the difference when you don't use the displacement map. And I want a metalness map. There it is. And let's have a look at the button. We see that the button is upside down. So let's go and turn them around. We can, in this property editor, when I've selected the button here, we have the angle. And so we'll watch in the 3D preview window. And there, that's about right. And I may want to play with the roughness a little bit, just because they may be a bit too shiny. Uh, but we won't see that until we get into the render window. So let's go there. Wow, that's really shiny. So we'll go back to our button and go find the roughness. Did we have a roughness map too? I think we did. There it 
it is. So that'll give hopefully just the right amount of sheen for our brass. Now I'm not liking the way the light is hitting it, so I'm going to adjust the light in a minute. But first I want to show you something. So I've put the normal map on the button, and so it looks like you know, it's, it's faked some shape. And it looks pretty good, but if you see at the edges, the edge of the button's pretty flat. And that's not how it looks in, in reality. And so that's where this displacement map comes in, like the displacement map we did on the jacket. And for this, we would use the height channel. So this one right here. And it didn't do anything because we haven't set an amount yet. So let's set it to one millimeter. And yuck, that's too much. 0.5. The displacement's a little bit too much still. So let's put it down to 0.25. So now what we want to do, because remember this button was really blank when we created it. It didn't have this brass material, it didn't have these um, textures, these these logos on them. Um, and if we wanted to reuse this in another project and I tried to reload those buttons, I'd have to redo all that work again. So under the property editor, as long as your button is selected, we can go to save. And we'll call it USCT, it's already called it that 24 line. and uh, put it in a place that makes sense to you and save it as a button file and now it's actually a button with color and images so you can reuse that later you can just open it from whatever folder you put it in in this shot if I had shot this with a camera in this very very tight macro shot I would have a very very shallow depth of field and so these buttons as my focal point would be in focus and the rest would be very much blurred out and while I could do this in Clo with some camera effects. I prefer to do it in Photoshop because I have more control in Photoshop. So my favorite little tool for this is going into the filter and the blur gallery and the field blur. Because so what you can do, you see it, it, it all blurs out. I grab this pin and I'll drop it on here and I can control the amount of blur or how sharp it is. So I'm going to drop this pin here and I'm going to drop another one here and I'm going to drop it on each of these buttons just to really protect the focus ooh, on these buttons because then I'm going to blow the rest of it out so let's blur this out and blur this out and this is kind of how a macro shot in real life in terms of focus would look like so here's my finished image of my US Olympic team brass button the next tutorial, we're going to look at a little bit more complex modeling in Blender and make a four-hole button with some thread. So I hope you've enjoyed this. If you have, like, subscribe, and do please join me on the next one.